are the biggest drivers of innovation in the fashion industry? That's, in, that's a good question. Um, the fashion industry has always been one that's really slow to adopt to any type of change. And I'd say the biggest driver of innovation is actually the consumer. And it's the consumer in a number of ways, obviously in digital innovation and, and stuff like that, but it's also actually in the production cycle. And what I mean by that is retailers are all very recently, I'd say, in the last you know, two to three years, really starting to think about the consumer in a different way. Before it was all about what am I going to design and push out to the consumer and hopefully they'll like it. Whereas now even they're thinking about how do we market to the consumers, how do we merchandise consumers, how do we incorporate their insights into the process and that's like a very new thing um, that's driving it. And on the other end of it you have, you know, now we all have this really um, strong expectation of technology and how it's going to work, how we expect, how fast we expect websites to be, how we expect the user experience to be. And fashion is always about newness and being cool and the latest thing. And so in an industry that's about s starting trends, they've actually been late. But now I actually think what we're going to see is a shift. Now that technology and um, using technology to enhance experiences is um, like kind of like very nouveau, I, I actually think they're going to start doing, the best brands are going to start incorporating technologies and delighting customers in new ways. And so the fashion industry is very competitive, right? Right. So uh, what are some unique, interesting ways that retailers or brands are using data to gain an advantage? So um, kind of going back to the earlier point, I'll give you a couple of examples of companies. Um, on, you know, on one spectrum, we see a lot of, you know, a lot of the companies here are focused on things around personalization of your experience, like when you're visiting a website. But even at the more fundamental level, um, you know, there are some really interesting companies that actually incorporate consumer insights into their production processes. And this is all like publicly shared information, but like you have interesting companies like uh, ModCloth. They have um, something called Be the Buyer program. So before they produce items, they're actually kind of crowdsourcing, you know, um, like opinions on different designs and making that and really involving the consumer into their process, almost like a quirky for fashion. And so I think um, they actually do a number of like really interesting things around that. And I think Nasty Gal also um, has, you know, really uses social media and like brings their consumer and like into their process and have. As a result, these brands actually have a really strong cult following and have been some of the fastest growing e-commerce companies in space. And how do you see this evolving? What will the landscape look like in the future, maybe 10 years out or so? So I think the industry itself is going through a tremendous shift right now. Um, there's more brands now. There's more brands every day. The barriers to entry are becoming much lower. Um, and like not only in production, but also in just terms of distribution. So even just the number of designers doing runway shows, the number of e-commerce stores that are out there are endless. And so I think, um, you know, how that's shifting is twofold. There's on one end, you have a lot of suppliers, but there's also consumer demand around it. You know, like 10 years ago, you know, when I was growing up, we kind of all assimilated and wanted wanted to be the same. If everyone was wearing khakis, we wear khakis. You know, you kind of all follow where, I think now there's more um, individuality and there's this wanting to be like independent. And so there's actually now multiple style tribes and uh, people who want to be different in different ecosystems of what's on trend and what's cool. And um, I think, that creates a lot of opportunity for more niche brands to actually gain hold. I think the days of the mass large brands are, are gone. I think there's a limit and a saturation to that, and which is why if you follow the financial markets, all these companies um, that, you know, they basically have 12 year cycles and, you know, they gain traction, you know, and then they come back out of style and it's like kind of this ebb and flow. But um, I think like J. Crew is a perfect example of that. It was very stayed for a while, and then they really came in and revigorated it and made it cool again. It's like kind of these ups and downs that are really interesting. And you, you were talking a little bit about the use of technology. In your Twitter stream recently, you linked to a story that was looking at the interactive technology that retailers are using inside stores and questioning whether that was an effective sales strategy or some sort of trendy fad. What's your take on that? 
I think it really depends on the retailer and how it's used. I mean, so it's great to introduce new technology into the stores and it might create some buzz and PR, but unless it's actually fulfilling a function, um, you know, it's, it's not going to continue to progress. And so if you think about something as simple as, um, you know, the Apple stores and what they did, like the Apple retail case study is actually fascinating. And I heard Ron Johnson actually speak about this really quite early on. And when they came up with the Apple store model, they broke all the rules of retail. They didn't care about the productivity per square foot and how much profits you were making. They didn't care about people waiting in line to the cash register. It was, again, all focused on the consumer. And, you know, obviously Apple has done well, but their retail stores have the highest sales per square footage in the industry. And so it's really interesting that it really comes back to the consumer and delighting them and creating newness around that. So I think as technologies embrace that, but also have a really strong function to it, um, and create more than just the shopping experience. I mean, shopping is really, in brick and mortar, it's not just functional, it's about entertainment. How do you bring people back and delight them? And the trend we're seeing in a lot of brick and mortar stores are actually doing more of like new lifestyle concepts. Um, and Urban Outfitters has been doing some really cool things uh, around you know, bringing the barber shop into the store, bringing music in, and it's all kind of going back to more of a lifestyle. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, looking at, you know, a little more into the technology side, the Internet of Things is having an effect across industries. Yeah. How is it affecting fashion, and is it becoming a, a larger and larger part of it? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I've looked at, like, functional fashion in a number of different ways in my past jobs where I used to invest. Um, but it's interesting. Actually, it takes those kind of authoritative fashion leaders to accept something and everyone kind of follows. And I think there's something to be said around you know, um, wearable technology where it has to be fashion first and then a function, but the function has to be great. And you have people like um, Diane von Furstenberg who actually had Google Glass on the runway you know, a couple of years ago. That really opened up that whole potential to be more mainstream, to be adopted by the industry. And you know, now Google Glass is um, inking deals with Exotica and becoming much more um, democratic. Um, you know, on the other end, you have like um, people like Tori Birch, um, you know, who's really well respected in the industry, and you know, one of the fastest growing bands um, in fashion. And you know, they created like a Fitbit bracelet that was gorgeous. You couldn't tell there was a Fitbit, but it had this functionality to it. Um, you know, and there's kind of been this trend of like opening ceremony. It's like the cool, new, like kind of really revered brands that are starting to do things like that. And I think it's because as consumers, we want these things in our lives. And how do we kind of make it to fit something about like what, what who we are and what we do. And, and to that point, I actually invested um, a while back. One of my first consumer product investments was in a company called Skull Candy. Very basic earphones. Um, you know, but they created, I mean, I would say that they actually revolutionized design in that market. Um, there was very few people that cared about design. And I remember the founder, Rick um, Elton, would say, you know, people care about sunglasses. At what point, you know, it like expresses your style. If we're wearing, you know, headphones every day and using our iPhones, why can't it be an expression of who we are? Right. Yeah, I have skull candy. <laughs> <laughs> So we're talking about you know involving the consumer, and there's a lot of human considerations. Yeah. What what part does human behavior play in fashion decisions? A ton. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Even before social media existed, this was actually a social thing. Um, fashion is not just clothes. What fashion is is about feeling the way someone feels about themselves, and um, the way like self-image, and you know buying something that you think is beautiful because it makes you feel a certain way. And you know, it's interesting, I did, I've done a lot of focus groups on accessories and all these different markets when I, I used to um, do retail concepts. And it's interesting to see, like, this is an industry where you have a very, very passionate person. And even if you look at the metrics across social media, let's say, um, the engagement for fashion brands is like through the roof versus like other categories. You have a consumer that wants to be a part of that conversation. And so it's interesting going back to your point, you know, social media and digital and all of this is really just a channel, but it's amplifying what already exists. Like fashion is about storytelling. It's about a brand saying why this t-shirt or why this silk blouse is different and what it was made of and you know when 
you know, and I get complimented or a lot of people, like, um, especially a lot of women, not to, like, you know, you know, it's like, you always have a story behind something, you know, it's like, oh, that's a nice dress, like, oh, let me tell you, I got it on sale, or, oh, the designer is like this and so-and-so, and, you know, it's around a conversation, and it's like, kind of like wearable art. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, shifting gears just a bit, um, what people or projects are you following? What are you finding really interesting these days? So, um, that's a good question. There's two projects that I think are kind of really interesting, kind of related to this space, um, that follows like different trends that are happening in the industry. Um, one is Modern Meadows. So, basically, this is um, you know a bioengineering company. They genetically make um, meat and also they're playing with like you know meat chips and stuff but also leather that's sustainable that doesn't require you know um so it's very like eco-friendly and they're taking an approach where they actually want to do leathers and target the luxury market and um the reason they're doing that is so that they can actually become a standard so start with the best you know the best of the best that have influence and make it like socially acceptable Um, and i think that's something that's really interesting um Another one, which is like personal to me, is actually a friend of mine who um, is doing a 3D printed jewelry line. So I'm actually wearing it right now. <laughs> her name's Jenny Wu, and she's just an incredible um, architect. I mean, her stuff is in the MoMA, and she's just—it's just really beautiful, and it suits my style. But I think there's always—I've always been fascinated with um, production cycles and how you kind of innovate on that. And I think, you know, 3D printing has been around for ages in architecture and other areas, but it's just really starting to get mass adoption. Now our awareness, and I think there's a, it'll be interesting to see where that goes, that it expands to other areas. I think consumers are very interested in personalization by a certain means, and we're seeing this across the retail landscape, um, where you can just change something just a little bit. And so as by example, like um, Nike ID started it years ago, where you can add your personal, like, you know, like initials to a shoe or like make certain changes and it's interesting like why it hasn't been more broadly adopted but now we're starting to see it more and more where stores will let you you know custom you know create like a little piece of the handbag or you can make shoes of prey is a fascinating site where you can like make your own shoe and play designer and I think all those things are really interesting yeah it kind of goes back to the customization yeah. personalization yeah. fascinating thank you very much for talking with me thanks today. it was great chatting